Okay. So, uh, hello, this is a talk on covering bad limits in the time of Halston. So, um, we'll be using, so, this this will be using the uh, covariant band limits introduced by um, Jason Pai and Nakim Kemp, and we'll be applying them to an entanglement harvest entanglement harvest protocol to uh, see what effects it has on physically measurable quantities. Okay, so uh, the model we'll be using is Klein-Gorman scalar field uh, with an unit interaction. So we're going to have phi as our scalar field. We're going to have uh, sigma x as the monopole which couples to the field and we'll just label two detectors by Alice and Bob a and b and so on equation one you can see the basic interaction Hamiltonian form so we have lambda which describes the interaction strength chi which tells us uh, when the detector is on or off or, and, and when it's interacting with the field the monopole sigma x and then we just have a smeared Spatial interaction with a field given by f of x to sort of uh, provide the detector with physical size and smooth off certain uh, divergences which arise from uh, point length detectors. Um, for computational simplicity, uh, for notational simplicity, sorry, um, I'll be condensing most of uh, the terms in, in interaction Hamiltonian into a single operator phi of A, so it will, um, and phi of B. So that will uh, involve, include the lambda, the chi, and the integral over A for X. Um, so that's equation three, yeah. Um, yeah. The principle of what we're gonna do is we're going to interact the, the the two detectors with the fields um and then we'll trace out the field and and see what the resulting reduced density matrix of the two detector system alice and bob is and study the uh, possibility of entanglement negativity the standard entanglement harvesting approach um so at the very end at the very bottom of the slide i've mentioned uh, once again that the UV cutoff we'll be using will be a, a covariant UV cutoff, and that works by uh, cutting off the spectrum of the Allen uh, Sorry. Uh, so basically, um, if we consider the eigenfunctions of a Allen version e to the i k mu x mu, then that will be uh, providing a cutoff for the magnitude of k mu, um, and that will play a role mostly with that plays a role with virtual particles, virtual excitations, rather than. Um, actual physical field excitations. So if we uh, grind through the mathematics of, of the standard entanglement housing approach, um, we find that after we trace out the field, so after the, inter the interactions have taken place and we trace out the field degree of freedom, we end up with a, an expression given by equation four, which basically describes um, the initial state of the detectors, which we take it to be their ground states, and then various um, coefficients describing the various excitations of the field. Uh, these coefficients depend on um, two point functions, uh, phi a of s, phi a of s prime, and so forth. And we can compress all that notation into um, a density matrix, which is very familiar for, for uh, it's very common in some of the papers to see this particular form, which is equation six. Um, so the, the key notes to see from this particular expression is that if we look at the second line from the bottom of equation four, we have um, this heavy side step function, theta of s minus s prime. And the implementation of a UV cutoff, or the covariant UV cutoff will affect uh, the behavior of that theta function. That's how, uh, and that will be primarily where the differences come when we implement a UV cutoff. Uh, Nico, just a question on um, the setup here. Yep. So is there an assumed shared phase reference between the two qubits? I'm sorry, phase reference. Yeah, so like how do they, how are the qubits knowing what time it is? Uh, well, in that case, I suppose there is a shared phase reference, yes. Um, 
the, I suppose there is an underlying assumption that uh, the two agents do have synchronized clocks um, and they're, they're some, yeah, the, the reference frame is well defined. It's not ambiguously defined. So it's all the agents know what they're doing. They have synchronized clocks. They, yeah, basically okay. the answer to your question is yes. I was just wondering what the, like the input state. So there's, yeah, so there's a, there's an assumed initial state and there's an assumed phase reference between them. I guess you also have to know there's a, a an actual reference frame for the angle with which the qubit is oriented. What defines like poly x is 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 it agreed upon oh. by the two observers? That two, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's. As long, so when it comes to defining what Pauli X is for either agent, um, it only really matters, the only thing that really matters is that the Pauli X, that the Pauli X, the, the commutation relation between the Pauli X and the Sigma Z, the, the Pauli Z, which is um, the, free Hamil the free Hamiltonian of the detector. So basically the, the Sigma X and the Sigma Z have to be, um, Sort of the, the orthogonals of one another, um, because this the sigma is because the field has no orientation itself. It's sigma z tensify the interaction Hamiltonian linear to interaction. So it's it doesn't really matter if the detectors are rotated relative to each other as long as the the sigma z which interacts with the field is actually um, the 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 x corresponds to the an orthogonal direction to the sigma z, which defines the energy gaps, if that makes sense. I, I don't know if that's true, Nico, because if that were the case, then then anything like sigma y or some other thing in the equator of the block sphere would do just as well. But in that case, if you don't know what you have, if you don't have a shared, if you don't have a shared phase reference, then you would have dephasing effectively you wouldn't be able to know what state you have so anyway i may i make a suggestion well, which is we can what, what noise is that what's what's the background noise there my background noise no i don't know who it is but someone is um it's probably kids in the park in front of my house oh okay yeah that could be um no that's cool anyway i don't know if that's true I mean, maybe you've thought about this more than I have, but but we don't need to do that. I think I think we can just safely say that all the machinery that's required to make this make sense is there, which includes shared reference frames, if you're okay with that. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't know, I don't know if you can just replace with something else. My guess is that you can't. You can't just rotate one qubit by some random angle and then have entanglement. You would have defaced it. No, I just, um, my yeah. suspicion is that the equation that the the density matrix equation six might look slightly different. The values might be slightly different, but you will ultimately get very similar results. Yeah, but you need to know but what you're it is. right. You need to know what you it is. Yeah. It is. yeah. It just got me thinking to be whether there would be a way to do entanglement harvesting from a field theory without a shared reference frame. Yeah, that's a good question. For example, if they shared a, you know, a, a qubit encoded in uh, spin zero states. Yeah, you might be able to do that. Yeah, you might be able to do that. Anyway, sorry, sorry. We'll let you go. No, that's that's a cool future work question. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Beyond the scope of this talk. Yes. That's definitely true. All right. Uh, let's continue then. Um, Okay, so uh, let's look at the uh, density matrix of the re the reduced density matrix of the two qubits after interaction. Um, so if we look at the, these term by term, uh, the L i j terms, as given in equation seven, they involve uh, multiple integrals of uh, x y k momentum s and s prime, uh, but there's no time ordering involved. So these these terms are as a result of um, first order perturbative expansions 
squared. Uh, on the other hand, the M term, which is equation eight, is a result of the second order perturbative uh, expansion. So they involve time ordering, uh, which means that when you flesh out and expand everything in terms of uh, momentum, you'll find that the time ordering function makes this expression off shell. Uh, that is to say that you will find expressions uh, depend. So you will you will find that the the, the the expression of M contains terms which uh, are eigenfunctions of the down version that are outside of uh, the on shell condition, which means that they that when we apply our UV cutoff, then those terms will vanish and M will be modified. Uh, the way to do this is um, we express the heavy side step function in terms of its uh, Fourier expansion, which is uh, what we have in equation nine, which it's basically an integral uh, d nu divided by nu minus i epsilon e to the i nu t. Um, so this this actually this expression uh, right, well you can demonstrate that this expression is true just by using uh, the residue theory from complex analysis. And when we actually start introducing a UV cutoff, what that will mean is it will uh, involve truncating the limits of the integral of d nu, and that means that. Um, it will no longer be a, a closed, it, it will no longer be a contour which can be closed, so we'll have uh, interesting effects coming about. Okay, now, uh, this is the uh, the first main result, uh, which is, uh, this is a diagram which is familiar to, to people who have worked in, in the time of harvesting before, which is basically a, a plot um, of the negativity, which is a, an indicator of entanglement, uh, as a function of omega, the energy gap, and r, the, the distance between the two detectors. So we're considering identical detectors so that they have the same spatial size and the same um, switching functions, so that they, in a sense, they, they're on simultaneously, but we separate them by a distance r, um, and they also have the same energy gap, capital omega. And one well-known result from harvest from entanglement harvesting is that um, the larger capital omega is usually uh, the, the trend is that the further apart you can separate the two detectors and obtain harvesting. The intuition behind this being that despite the fact that the more you separate detectors, um, the smaller correlations between them will be, but also um, the larger you make capital omega, it, the less sensitive it is to local noise. So um, the trade-off ends up being basically this curve that you see here. Um, so basically that means that for small omegas and large Rs, which is the bottom right hand of the diagram, you can see that harvesting is not possible. So that means that the negativity uh, of the density matrix is zero and to the top left, it's non-zero, even though it may be very, very small. Uh, as for the UV cutoff itself, what we see is um, in blue, the, the line in blue corresponds to a non-UV cutoff um, plot. Uh, and in red, we have something with a very large, uh, let me rephrase that, with a very small UV cutoff, so a very significant UV cutoff. Um, in this particular case, uh, the UV cutoff capital lambda is equal to 0 0.1 divided by tau tau is uh, basically the characteristic size of the switching function. So this means this is a, this cutoff is tremendously small, uh, something which should be quite, well, should already be experimentally measurable. Um, so obviously it's, I just put it in there to exaggerate the effects, but you can see that um, for large omega, we see an extension in the range uh, for which harvesting is possible. Um, and this is a, a result really of the, the fact that introducing a UV cutoff means that your detectors now behave slightly more non-locally, um, which is a serious issue really when we consider the, the fact that a covariant UV cutoff has suddenly meant that we now have the possibility of superluminal communication, um, which is an issue which will need a solution you know, in, in some way, but. Uh, 
for Ryan Fennell, there is none. I, to, I, I can't propose one. Um, I can't remember why it was that at, at uh, in the bottom left hand corner we get a, a change as well. I, if I remember correctly, it was um, in the bottom left. So for small omega, but small r, um, harvesting becomes more challenging when you have a, a, a very small UV cutoff because you have fewer modes accessible. Uh, so there's fewer channels for which um, correlations and, and entanglement can be transferred between one and the other. Right. Uh, any questions or confusions about this graph? Okay. Uh, if we look at, um, okay, so what we're going to do now is uh, basically take a, a horizontal slice of, of this particular graph and plot the negativity as a function of distance, as a function of R for a specific value of capital omega. Um, No, I'm sorry, I tell a lie. That's not what this graph is. This graph is telling us, let me go back to this. This graph is showing us the difference between the red line and the blue line as a function, uh, basically uh, how much the entanglement range changes as we change capital omega. Yeah, that's what it is. Uh, so if we go, if we ignore the, the small omega behavior, which is where the range diminishes, uh, what we actually see is we have this sort of oscillatory behavior um, where we have uh, for certain values of omega we have an increase in in the range and, and so forth um, i haven't really checked exactly uh this but i suspect that for particular values of particular omegas energy gaps we have a resonance with the cutoff so that's probably why we have um, this particular oscillatory behavior importantly though if we increase the uh, cutoff, uh, we see that the, the oscillatory behavior becomes more frequent, uh, but also if we look at the y-axis, it becomes smaller. So the intuition will be that as the cutoff gets taken to infinity, so as we remove the cutoff, uh, we'll see that the oscillatory behavior becomes infinitely free, in, uh, oscillatory, but also infinitely small. So eventually um, that means that we will recover basically the non-UV cutoff uh, system which is what we'd really expect. Um, now, this is uh, the negativity. So one thing worth noting is that so far, I've just talked about entanglement range. Uh, this is now quantity of an entanglement negativity. So this will be uh, telling us how much entanglement harvesting we can actually do for various UV cutoffs. And this is for omega is equal to 40 divided by sigma t, so extremely large number, uh, ext extremely large energy, energy gap compared to the, the um, switching function time. And basically what you can see is that there is virtually no change. Um, these lines are very close to one another. Uh, yeah, and there's not much to see really. However, if we change it to a, a, an energy gap, which is small, uh, suddenly we see a major difference. So the dashed line basically corresponds to no UV cutoff. Um, and as we increase, this is a terrible notation, as we decrease the UV cutoff, um, you see that the, the effect is that the negativity decreases significantly. Um, so again, this, this mechanism is, is as a result of the diminished number of virtual modes, which can which are used to exchange uh, correlations between Alice and Bob, basically. And this, and also you can see basically that uh, this, if you look at the x-axis, you can see the corresponding uh, reduction in entanglement range as a result of this as well. Okay, so having seen that uh, the entanglement range increases for uh, large distances, um, the question becomes, a, a secondary question arises, which is that why does the entanglement range increase? And this more, the more simple question to ask in that case is, 
instead of uh, entanglement harvesting, that's just considered simple communications. So we'll have the same setup in terms of detectors, uh, two detectors identical and in, in, in terms of switching functions and, and smearing functions. But what we're going to do now is we're just going to interact them with the, we're going to interact them with a the field and we're going to uh, interact Alice first and then we're going to interact Bob second after Alice. And we're going to ask, does Bob's reduced density matrix, so tracing out the field and Alice's detector, um, does Bob's reduced density matrix have any uh, contribution from Alice? That is to say that if Alice has contrib if Alice contrib if Alice interacts with the field, can Bob somehow detect some signature from that in his density matrix? And the usual answer, if we have a causal model, and if Alice and Bob are space like separated, is no. Alice won't be uh, detectable by Bob. But if uh, we don't have a, a causal model, then Alice would be able to be detected by Bob. Um, right. Uh, so we we have a, a, a we start with a very simple setup, which is um, we just let Alice have some specific um, initial condition alpha zero plus beta one. We'll have Bob also having a, a specific initial condition. And the final cat equation 15 just describes a particular measurement um, that Bob will perform uh, uh, to determine whether or not he can detect Alice. So it's just, uh, it'll just be turning basically Bob's reduced density matrix into a, uh, a probability, a number, a real number. Um, this is basically just a rewriting of the. Uh, of the same problem a few slides back. Um, we have our second order perturbative expansion. We have a heavy side step function. And this, oh, we'll just get the slide. That's the, just the density matrix after the fact. Now, yeah. So now, so we trace out Alice's detector, we'll trace out uh, the field, and we're left with uh, Bob's um, reduced density matrix. And that will involve terms that are that are that are independent of of lambda. That it will involve terms which depend on lambda b, and it will involve terms which depend on lambda a times lambda b. Uh, now the 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 zeroth order terms and the first order terms for Bob are going to be independent of Alice's contributions, so they they're not included into this slide. So we address our focus to the lambda a, lambda b terms. And that's what's written down here in equation 19. Um, now this is, now what we've done here is we've already included the, um, we, we've, the, the, the heavy side step function has already been UV cutoff, and it's the, the effects of that UV cutoff are now encoded into this function, uh, capital I, the superluminal contribution. With that, when you don't have a UV cutoff, that term isn't there. And basically, what it boils down to is that the fact that we have delta functions R minus S plus S prime, that is just a strong, that's a reworking of the strong Huygens principle, basically, a demonstration that um, Bob's. This this term from Bob's density matrix, the ones which depend on lambda a times lambda b, will be non-zero only if Bob's interaction crosses with Alice's uh, light cone. And for completeness, I've written down what the what the capital I is in, in equation twenty, but it's it's more constructive just to see it plotted out. Um, so this is what it looks like. This is the function which uh, describes the non-locality of communication between Alice and Bob. Now, if we look at the uh, the last line of equation 19, we'll see that um, I is next to the delta function. So for this to be causal communication, we'd want the, the I to be somehow looking like the delta functions. But as you can see, it's, it's not. It's, a, it's an oscillatory function, which actually, from what I can tell, uh, it doesn't, it actually just 
once it's it's gotten rid of this initial envelope, it just proceeds at a, a constant height uh, till infinity and just oscillates away. And um, <clears throat> and that basically means that we that this non-local function means that we no longer have uh, a co a causal communication theory. One thing though to note, or one thing that I'm seeing, I see that when I look at this this plot really is the fact that um, when we have a non-covariant UV cutoff, we know that there is this um, lattice along which if you stick to the lattice points, you have causal communication. But if you're in between the lattice points, you suddenly have um, non-local behavior and, and increased correlations taking place. Um, I suspect, well, not suspect, I hope that this function basically tells us that there is another lattice which arises from a covariant UV cutoff, which can also be used to um, basically create a, a, a causal theory on a particular lattice. Um, and then we'd use something like a, a Shannon sampling theory to smooth out between the points whilst maintaining uh, causality. Um, We'll see. Uh, anyway, so that pretty much uh, brings these results to a conclusion, uh, which is that we introduce a covariant UV cutoff, and that meant that this result in the coarse graining of detector field interactions. Basically, it means that detectors now behave non locally, not by introducing non local excitations to the field, but by introducing non local excitations to the virtual field. Um, so you can only really see it when you have two detectors. Uh, detector self interactions don't seem to be affected by these cutoffs. So if we only consider one detector, the excitation probabilities don't really change when you introduce these cutoffs, which is again uh, what I was meaning by coarse graining of the virtual field and two detectors are needed for just the first point. Um, so one one way of, of detecting this this change or the, detecting the magnitude of the UV cutoff is that the entanglement range increases in for certain energy gaps. So uh, that's basically the role of this coarse grain non-locality. Um, one thing which I haven't gone out to check yet is this coarse graining should be covariant. So this this plot here. Um, basically, it's for a specific time. Uh, time is equal to zero, actually. Sorry, and we see that it introduces a non-locality in space. Uh, but this capital I function really should be a function of uh, the space-time distance between R and T. Really, if we want it to be a, um, we will expect it to be because it's a covariant theory. It's a covariant UV cutoff, so we will also expect this function to be, in some sense, uh, covariant. And uh, future work, which is what I was working on recently, is to use these coarse graining consequences to try and uh, derive a generalized uncertainty principle. So basically make the, this entire argument circular, which is that generalized uncertainty principles were the motivation for introducing covariant UV cutoffs. Um, and then we'll see if we can return by using the covariant UV cutoffs to create rigorously generalized uncertainty principles and see if, if this equivalence holds both ways. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's bad for the talk. Um, sorry that it wasn't a great talk, but uh, as I said before. Um, I, I didn't really prepare properly for it, but let's see. Anyway, uh, thanks. Any questions? Uh, before questions, Nico, I'm going to take issue with that. I think it was a good talk. You don't have to. You don't have to do a spectacular one. I think that was good. What What, what would you rather have had? How about? I guess I just jumped in there. Sorry. What would you rather have had? First question. Sorry for the talk. Yeah. What What's missing? Uh, no, the content is okay. It's just that I made these slides. A week or two ago, so I wasn't, I couldn't remember what was on them. 
I see. Okay. Um, Presentation. Yeah. Uh, no, the... This method of choosing a lattice that preserves um, like causal communication. Is that, I think that's uh, two slides previous, one slide previous? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the T equals zero communication. Uh, it, this function doesn't look like a delta function at zero. Like it looks like it approaches zero at uh, space time equals zero. Yeah. Or is well, that just an issue with the plot? No, it should be zero. Um, Yeah, it's a tricky one, but it seems that uh, this, for the same reason that uh, detector self interactions are unaffected, if you have two detectors overlapping one another, then we'd expect the interactions not to be affected. So that's my intuition as to why i goes to zero. I suspect that if the detectors weren't identical, then this plot might not be zero at r is equal to zero. Um, but I'm not sure, uh, I'd have to check that, I'm not sure. I see. And the other, the other question I had is, uh, if you would choose some, you know, some Nyquist lattice such that this does preserve only the local communications, does that imply that there is a preferred lattice for the covariantly band limited theory? Or is that like, this R here is, a, you know, it's it's position A minus position B or the other way around. Yeah, so it's, so uh, it basically be a lattice which is defined. Um, well, the only important, the only special point on the lattice would be Alice's initial position. Um, that That would be the way to break uh homogeneity and isotropy of, well it wouldn't break isotropy of the system but it break homogeneity of the system in the sense that you define a special point which is where alice's interaction starts or where alice is during the interaction um but aside from that there wouldn't be a special lattice or orientation for the lattice so the lattice would be defined in terms of the agents interacting with the field um but now that I say that out loud, it does uh, seem increasingly unlikely that that would work. Yeah, the other the other question there is: Are we sure that um, these oscillations are um, of a single frequency? Ah, uh, no, it's a Bessel function of sorts, so it's it wouldn't be. Yeah, it looks like they're like widening a little bit. Well, I'm not sure; I can't see from the picture. But... Yeah, I'd have to check the Mathematica script, but I, I seem to recall it being. Um, Bessel functions. So no, although for long R's, I think it's seem to recall that they do start becoming uh, more regular. Hmm. Yeah, you'd be a weird lattice nonetheless. Yeah. I had a uh, bit of a quick question regarding um, the oscillatory behavior of the entanglement distances. Um, so one of the claims was that as the cutoff goes to infinity, these oscillations become more frequent and the amplitude vanishes. Could this be seen a bit more explicitly maybe by a plot where we look at the... Um, the entanglement range as a function of the cutoff? Would that be possible to see? Uh, well, sort of. That's basically what this plot is showing. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit of a challenge to, um, to plot entanglement range because it's, the most interesting feature of it 
or at least the, the, the clearest feature of the plot really was this one, which is um, how the range changes when you change the energy gap of the detectors. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to pick a particular omega. And then if you want, mm. as you say, you'd, you'd pick a particular omega and then you'd put the cutoff on the x-axis of this plot. And then that wouldn't be... Um, well, then I suspect it wouldn't be as descriptive. Which is more or less why I picked this one. Um, it's also the way I've written the program is that the numerical program is it, I asked it for this really. So yeah. <clears throat> can I can I follow up on that? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I want to make sure I understand what you're plotting here. So um, what is the parameter in the previous plot? So you have a lambda equals 0 0.1 over tau on this plot. What would be the lambda in the previous plot? Sorry, the previous slide. Yeah, that one. What's the lambda? 0 0.1 on tau. Okay. So this is saying, so there's a crossover point that happens at uh, what? What are you plotting? At, the, at an omega of a little under 2, like 1.8 1 1 or something? And does that show up on the other plot? Do you go forward one slide? Uh, no, it doesn't look like it does. Omega equal to two or something. Oh, it is. It is showing up there. Okay, but this is actually not showing. Oh, ah. So right. basically the problem is that in this plot, when you get to about R is equal to five, Yeah. Um, the blue line and the red line sort of overlap and the thickness of the lines obscure. No, that's the fine, I, but, but I, that's okay, but I can see that. So an R equals five is an omega e of about 1.8 or something. So if we go to the next slide real quick. Your omega of 1.8, I mean, that, that entire previous plot is all contained on the far left-hand side of that, of the left-hand plot here, because it goes negative, for a portion and then it goes up. So it looks like there's some transient behavior for small omega. And then there's just oscillation as omega gets larger. Yeah. Right. And cool. what you've shown on the previous plot is just the transient behavior. Sorry? What you've shown on this plot is just the transient behavior. Because your omega on this plot only goes up to four and a half or so. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. So if you were to enlarge that plot on the previous slide, you would see the red line oscillating, uh, uh, touching the blue line and then oscillating outward and then touching the blue line and moving No, outward. yes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's okay. exactly true. All right. So that's very interesting because it shows that there's two clearly, well, not clearly, but there's two delineated regimes. The first one is this transient behavior for small omega. Uh, where small is probably, well, we'll have to figure out what that is. Uh, maybe it's given by by the switching time, perhaps. Uh, what What is the switching time here? Is it one? Uh, yeah, well, for numerical purposes, tau is equal to one. But everything is defined in terms of tau. Uh, R okay. is also... So, is, so R really, is R on tau. Yeah. And omega is omega tau. Yeah. All right. All right, great. So then lambda should be 0.1. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, good. So that means that for omega of order one, we should see weirdness because that's omega of the order of the switching. Mm -hmm. So that transient behavior has to be switch, or not has to be, but I'm hypothesizing that it's switching related. So um, the, the transient behavior for small omega and small r so the fact that that red line is is to the left of the blue line in the bottom yes. left corner, um, I think that that's that's more actually to do with the fact that the two uh, the two smearings, two special smearings, overlap. So in that case, it's not really entanglement harvesting anymore. It's more like um, well, it's just two qubit communications, really. Um, uh, okay, but then that's dictated by. I'm I'm thinking about the physical parameters here. So, okay, I see. So you're saying when omega is close to one, but you could, okay, hang on. I'm saying many things at once. So you can have an R that's quite low, 
but an omega that's high. Uh, right, that doesn't matter. The the sharpness of that. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. So there's so, there's so a few... this plot has uh, something uh, it has a hidden truth to it. The fact that um, as omega changes are also changes because we're sticking to um, the blue. No, line that's fine. Basically. So yeah, that's fine. That's fine because you're plotting you're plotting delta r of the red and the blue. Yeah. The difference between them. yeah that that's great that's that's very nice actually. So um, but what this tells me is that so i remember from regular old entanglement harvesting just you know flat space time gaussian distribution um you had a scale invariant plot uh, except for the um except for when you were in the bottom left region and that's because those are switching effects anyway we're probably it's probably splitting hairs here but there, at order one, you're going to see some weird behavior. Is that true in the other plot as well? That it's at order one on the right. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it looks is. like it. Yeah. Yeah. So once you get to about ten, then it seems to be rather flat. But there's some weird shit that happens when it's less than that. So I would suspect that if you kept going, you would have. It looks like it's an overshoot there. So you'd have an overshoot, and then it would do this this increasing range so that's that's actually a really nice result because it's similar to what laura found with the non-covariant one and what she found was that there was an increase in the range at which you could harvest entanglement that had an oscillatory uh, uh, behavior and this mm -hmm. also shows an oscillatory behavior and it's strictly greater than uh it, it's it's strictly greater than zero once you're past the transient region yeah i suppose that one of the things though is that the non-covariant cutoff it's sort of you it's not surprising that you have an increase in range um, absolutely. absolutely because we, we know it's no longer a local theory technically but um but we made a claim in that yeah. paper that it was a decent model for some limit of the covariant one. And we just kind of pulled that out of our ass. <laughs> yeah, and but so, uh, nonetheless, this seems to support it. So it does uh, seem to support it, yeah. So that's kind of nice. I mean, I know that when I say we, I mean, I literally mean Laura and me. I'm sure Akim had some. Akim has mentioned this in previous papers. <laughs> and so I think it, it, it uh, I mean, we quoted that. and he has good reason to believe it. So um, it, I'm glad to see it show up here. Very nice and quantitative. Yeah. That's good. You got some nice results. Any other questions before I stop the recording? Okay. Thank you.